Welcome to this introductory presentation for residents and fellows as you begin your rotation in cross-sectional interventional radiology. The focus of this talk is on how to prepare and set up for an image-guided biopsy, aspiration, injection, or catheter drainage procedure. I will not be including every topic and detail on the subject, but hopefully this overview will help get you off to a good start. As you review this general workflow for interventional radiology, keep in mind that everything you can do to prepare in advance, including gathering all anticipated uh, needed devices and supplies for the procedure, will help expedite not only the procedure, but the workday. These are some of the standard steps we follow once the patient is brought into the room. And I'll now provide a series of video demonstrations for you. I'm Dr. Shin, and uh, we're going to talk about a variety of uh, topics to kind of get you started in uh, CSIR, cross-sectional interventional radiology, where we do image-guided biopsies, drainages, and other procedures. So one of the first things after you've consented the patient, you've done your timeout, uh, you're, you're going to glove up. And if it's just a uh, paracentesis or thoracentesis, uh, or lumbar puncture, where you basically are putting a single needle in and removing fluid, you'll just put gloves on. Uh, for everything else, you'll also gown, uh, gown and glove. And of course, you always wear a cap and a mask. Uh, when you put gloves on, if, if you don't have a gown, uh, just pick up the right glove by the sleeve and work your, your hand, hands into the glove and pull it over and let go. And then put your fingers under the cuff of the left glove, and then put your fingers in and pull it up. And then you can get the cuff on this one and bring it up. And notice that for the, the paper that holds the gloves, we, I folded the, the, the rim closest to me over so that it would stay open. Okay, so that's just to show you how to put gloves on. Uh, when you start the service, we'll go through all the sterile procedures about gowning up properly and gloving up properly also when you have a gown on. Um, one of the first things you'll do uh, if we're doing a CT guided procedure is we usually use a grid to localize the area that we're going to enter. Uh, and so what you'll do is you'll just peel this sticker off and the grid lines will go uh, kind of vertically along the patient's body so that when they're in the scanner and we get a cross-sectional scan, we see the dots on the skin surface. And then that will, for a particular slice, uh, will mark the grid line where we want to go into the body with the needle. And uh, to mark the skin, we use the, uh, these purple markers. And uh, these uh, are supplied in every room. And you'll just go over, once we put the table at the correct slice position, we'll mark the skin using the laser light. Uh, this, this top button turns on the laser light, and I'll show you an image of that later. This is the control uh, panel for the uh, CT table. And two of our CT scanners have this type of device. Um, and what's nice about it is that it has a joystick, so you can move the table in or out using the joystick. Uh, if you move the table and you like the table position and want to save it, uh, you can use number one. And this, this uh, button here has a computer disk, and that, if you press that, that saves your table position. You can also save a second table position. And then whenever you want to go back to that position, you just press and hold until the table gets to that point and stops. Uh, this is uh, a button that allows you to control your joystick. If you press it once, uh, it'll just move the table one increment at a time. If you press it again, it'll move the table continuously until you let go of the handle. And this is your laser light. Uh, this is the laser light and then the power button. Oh, here's the power button on, on here on the right.
So we talked earlier about placing the grid on the patient and then you do your preliminary scan and then you're ready to mark the scan. So one thing, you can double check the table position. So when you're at the console and you've looked at the uh, scan, you picked your image uh, that has the slice you want to use to mark the scan. When you walk into the room, just confirm that it's the correct uh, table position. Uh, and then pressing this top button will turn on the laser light. You can see the laser light projecting here on the sheets. It will also project on the patient's body and then that's the line where you're going to put your mark with your uh, radio peg marker and again because you have the grid on that will show you exactly where the grid line is that you want to mark. Okay, if we're doing an ultrasound guided procedure, uh, you'll first enter the patient information into the uh, ultrasound unit. Uh, generally because of the network you can just find the patient on the patient list and populate the screen. Don't forget to put gel on the probe once you've already done your preliminary scan and marked the skin for the ultrasound guided procedure. Um, then put some gel on the probe so that once you're sterile and ready to uh, put a, a sterile probe cover on the probe, it, it already has gel on it. Okay, now we're going to kind of go through a variety of items that you'll find on your sterile tray. And uh, all of these items will not be on your tray every time. Of course, it'll depend on the procedure, but I took out most of the uh, types of devices that we use to kind of give you an introduction. So let's take a look. Uh, one of the first things that you're going to look at on your tray are the prep sticks. And we usually put a couple of prep sticks on the table. Uh, and so you'll, what I do when I first come to the sterile table, I'm already gowned and, and have gloves on, mask and cap. I'll break the, the seal on the prep stick so that the chlorhexidine and alcohol uh, will move down into the brush. And, uh, and then one of the first things I'll do before I set up the rest of my tray is I'll go ahead and prep the patient's skin. And the reason I do that early is so that after I prep, it, it has a chance to dry. And that's particularly important if I'm going to use an adhesive uh, drape so that it will stick nicely to the patient. With these chlorhexidine prep sticks, uh, you can just scrub the skin for about 30 seconds. And so with the first brush, I just scrub, uh, you know, about a 5 to 10 centimeter, uh, or about a, about a uh, 5 to 10 inch diameter area. And with the second prep stick, I scrub again, and then at the very end, I spiral out. And uh, then once you've prepped it, you can uh, throw away your prep sticks. And one suggestion, and when you do procedures, every time you finish with a device or uh, some material that's on your tray and you're not going to use it again, I just throw it in the trash so that I don't clutter my tray. Now, uh, at this point, I'm going to kind of start setting up my tray while things are drying. And so one of the things I do is I take my scalpel and I push the blade all the way out to the end until it locks in place. And that way, when I make my incision, the blade doesn't tend to collapse. And the way I usually make the incision is I hold the scalpel uh, near the end of the green handle like a pen and then I stabilize the skin with, with this finger and I put the blade pointing away from this finger and then I make an incision. And you can kind of saw a little bit you know, to make it longer if you need to. I avoid plunging the scalpel all the way down into the skin because then you get more bleeders like venous subcutaneous uh, bleeders and then you have to stop and hold pressure. Um, if you need a, if, you, if you're doing a catheter drainage you can make a longer incision that's long enough for your catheter but then you can use your tissue spreaders which are these to kind of loosen up the subcutaneous tissues. When you're finished with your scalpel you can either retract the blade or you can just stick it in your sharps uh, receptacle here. You're going to have syringes on your table, and whenever you drop any medications, you have to label the syringe. So for example, this is going to be the syringe we use for lidocaine. 
So we have a, a label on here for lidocaine, and what we're going to attach an 18 gauge needle to this syringe to draw up the lidocaine. And notice that 18 gauge needles generally have a pink hub. 20 gauge needles usually have either a yellow or a gray hub, and uh, the, the 25 gauge needle has a blue hub. So with the 18 gauge needle, we're going to draw up our lidocaine and then, then we'll switch to the 25 gauge when we actually give the local. When you draw up lidocaine, we typically will mix it with some sodium bicarbonate. The sodium bicarbonate will take the stain out of the local anesthetic. So if you're using 1% lidocaine, you can just drop 1 mil of sodium bicarbonate and then 9 mils of 1% uh, xylocaine. If you're using 2% xylocaine, maybe use 2 mils of sodium bicarbonate. I first draw up the uh, sodium bicarbonate because it's the smaller volume. And you pull in a cc or two ccs in your syringe and then pull the 1% lidocaine in to fill up the rest of the syringe and then it's all it's nicely mixed. Uh, when you draw up your uh, local, uh, I'll typically for example if it's a if it's a five mil bottle of lidocaine, I'll just pull back my plunger of five mils and then I'll uh, put in five mils of air and then draw back the, the lidocaine. Uh, if it's 10 mils, I'll use a little bit more, like six or seven cc's of air, and then pull back the whole 10 cc's of lidocaine. Uh, usually, the nurse will, will be holding the bottle for you. and Just ask them to hold it still. Uh, if the nurse is trying to adjust to your needle and you're trying to adjust to the bottle, it's sometimes a, a little bit confusing, so just ask them to hold it still and then place your needle and it's inserted. I've noticed some people will, will put their finger on the needle to stabilize the needle before they put it in, but you risk contaminating your finger. There's really no reason to do that. So just hold the syringe, place it into the uh, bottle, and then push it in, and then draw up your solution. When applying local anesthetic, please do not initially stab the needle into the subcutaneous tissues. Instead, start off with a very small gauge, 25 gauge needle for example, and at a very flat angle, shallow angle, just insert it just below the surface of the skin to create the initial wheel. Slowly inject the lidocaine to uh, gradually raise the wheel on the skin surface. This is the most painless way to initiate cutaneous local. I'm often surprised to see people stab the needle into the subcutaneous tissues and then lift the needle and the skin to inject into the cutaneous uh, tissues. This is really not the way to do it. After you've created the wheel, then pull out the needle, reinsert the needle in the center of the wheel, and inject into the subcutaneous tissues and deeper subcutaneous tissues as needed. Keep in mind that subcutaneous fat is not pain sensitive in general. Uh, the areas that are pain sensitive are the skin, the peritoneal surface, the pleura, and other fascial interfaces. If you're going to do a paracentesis or a thoracentesis, you're going to use a centesis catheter. That's a sheath that has a needle that goes through it and a plug. If we're doing a thoracentesis, we use a valved uh, centesis catheter so that air doesn't uh, get sucked into the chest cavity when we pull the needle out. Uh, so if we're going to use this, we'll have it ready in the sharps. Uh, similarly, if we're going to use a Chiba needle for a biopsy or for access, We'll put that in our sharps. This is just a, a 20 gauge Chiba. Notice the yellow hub is 20 gauge. Uh, again, pink is 18 gauge. Uh, this is a Temno core biopsy set. Uh, this is the 17 gauge introducer, and then this is the 18 gauge core biopsy needle. Uh, this is a depth gauge that we rarely use, so you can just take it off and put it away. I usually loosen the stylet and then gently tighten it just so that it's ready to go, but not, so that it's not going to be too tight when I'm ready to uh, take out the stylet. So I'll put this in my sharps, have it ready to go, and then the 18 gauge core biopsy device is ready to go. I like to have the tip of this needle resting on something like 
um, some paper so that it doesn't poke through the the drape on the tabletop. Because once it does that, you have to discard it and get a new one. This, by the way, is our selection of labels. So we also peeled off a sodium chloride label to put on our saline dish, and we'll fill that with normal saline for most procedures. This small container can be used for saline. Uh, for example, if you want to uh, take a core biopsy and submit it for flow cytometry, you may submit it in saline. Uh, or if you do a, a fine needle biopsy and you want to submit a cell block, You'll just put aspirates uh, into the saline, and then that will go to the pathology, the cytopathology department, and they'll spin it down to make a cell block. Okay, we also have a ruler in case you need it to measure something. Uh, we have two sizes of gauze, uh, this, and so that's uh, ready to go. Uh, we have a couple of different types of uh, drapes here. This is a small eyelet sheet. This one's typically reserved for like head and neck procedures because it's so small. And so if you're going to use it, what I'll do is I'll keep it folded and just peel the backing off like this. And then what you'll notice, the adhesive goes all the way around and then this is the eyelet hole. And uh, just so you can see it, I'm going to put a towel here. Let's say this was the patient. What I do is I put the eyelet hole exactly where I want my needle to go. And I keep it folded because then I can place it perfectly. Then I open it up and press it on the skin. And then I unfold it. And then remove this paper. And then your eyelet, this is where you'll be working and this is sterile. Um, so that's a small one. Again, that's mainly for head and neck. And we also have a larger one. It works the same way. I keep it completely folded and then just peel off the backing. And then again, if this is where I'm going to go on the patient's skin, I put my sheet right here. I open it and press it firmly onto the skin so it sticks. We wait, you know, because we prepped early, the, the prep solution has dried and this will stick nicely. Then you unfold the drape and you'll notice arrows on the drape and that tells you which way to open the drape. So here the arrow is pointing that way, so we're just going to pull the drape over this way and now we see an arrow pointing that way, so we're going to pull this drape that way and then take, take off this sheet and then we'll work here. So that's how you use an eyelet uh, sheet. Uh, we also have a half drape that's usually placed on the, on the table. And so if you're doing a CT guidance procedure, for example, the patient's going to be going in and out of the scanner. And so even though you may have an eyelet drape up here on the patient's upper abdomen, the lower extremities are going to be going in and out and passing you. And so that, uh, so that you don't get contaminated, we'll just open up one of these large uh, half drapes. And what I like to do is open it like this and then let it open in front of me like that. And then I can approach the table and lay it over the patient and this keeps me from contaminating my own gown on the, on the sheets uh, that are covering the patient. So now we've covered the lower extremities of the patient. And so as the patient goes in and out, everything is covered. Okay, so going back to the tray, uh, I'll show you a few other items on here. Uh, uh, we have a keyboard cover. And the keyboard cover has two uses. Uh, obviously, we use it as a keyboard cover for the ultrasound machine. And we also use it as a gantry cover for the, the control panel and the gantry of the CT scanner. Uh, I find that the easiest way to handle this is 
you know, it comes folded like this. I just open it, but keep it folded like an accordion, and I hold it uh, from one end so it's dangling, and then I just grab the, the, the backing of the adhesive and pull it off with one hand, and then I take one end in each hand with the adhesive facing away from me, and if I'm going to drape the CT gantry, I'll come over here and I'll put the drape about like this so that it hangs well away from the table. And the reason you, you don't want it too close to the table is because as the patient goes in and out, the blankets, the sheets, the, or the clothing of the patient can touch this drape and then that can, that can also then be pulled across the sterile field as the patient goes in and out. So make sure you place this drape far enough from the table so that you don't have a problem with contamination. Um, if you're going to use it to cover the keyboard on the ultrasound machine, you'll just bring it over here and you'll place it across the scanner like this. I don't put it on the monitor because the monitor is adjustable and you may want to move it so that it's more convenient for you to see during the procedure. So put the keyboard cover across the top of the uh, machine just above the control panel here. Now I'm just going to take it off for now, but th with this, this allows you to operate all of the controls uh, but with remaining sterile. And then uh, if, if like your attending is not wearing sterile gloves, they can reach underneath and make some adjustments uh, to the machine. There's a, key, there's a uh, transducer probe cover. Uh, and these come in different designs as well. I'll show you this particular one. They usually come with two rubber bands, a pack of sterile gel, and the probe cover itself. And so the gel, I'll usually just open it so it's ready to go, and put it on the tray, and then the rubber bands are ready. And then I take the keyboard cover, and you, I mean the uh, Pro cover, and these generally have uh, an indicator of where you're going to put your hand. So, for example, when you open up, you'll see that there's a, 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 a hand diagram. That's where you're going to insert your hand. So I put my hand in here, and then this arrow is where I'm going to put the, the probe itself. So now you can grab, you've already put gel on the probe, so you grab the probe, and then just hold it in front of you, and grab the outer sleeve, and then just slowly pull it down in one motion, and then again, grab the outer sleeve, just pull it down. And you do it kind of in one motion. If, if, you, if you just try to do a motion like this, you may accidentally touch the cable and contaminate your hand. And then you just make sure that you've got uh, no wrinkles on the probe face and that there's a, there's a little bit of gel underneath the probe cover. And then you can take a rubber band and just put it over the probe like that. Some people like to put a second one down here. I usually just put one under the head of the probe. Now, once the probe has a sterile uh, uh, cover, there's a couple things to keep in mind. One is you want to keep it sterile, and so you can hang it over the, the back of the tray, but keep in mind our procedure rooms are often quite small. Uh, this is a pretty small room. The ultrasound room is even smaller, and so the back of the tray often gets pushed up against the wall and can theoretically be contaminated. So what I'll usually do is take a sterile towel and just hang it over the back so that I can place my probe cover, my probe over the edge so that it doesn't fall off the table but it's also still sterile. Other items to look at here, uh, if we're doing a paracentesis or a thoracentesis, they'll provide you with this uh, uh, vinyl extension uh, wall suction tubing. And, uh, what you'll do is you'll take, so this is called a vinyl connecting tube, 
It has a uh, catheter, uh, a female catheter uh, connection end and a lower lock end. And on the lower lock end, there's a two-way stopcock, so I just always make sure it's snugly attached, and I close the stopcock. And then on the, the other end, the catheter uh, end, I take this tubing that has a little extension here, and I fit that in and press it in so it's ready to go. So now this tubing is ready to go. This will attach to the synthesis catheter, and this you'll hand off to the nurse who will connect it to wall suction. Just a few other items to look at on the tray. We have steri strips if you need them for anything. We talked about the tissue spreaders. You can also use this as a needle driver. Uh, okay, if you're going to do a catheter drainage, they may put a drainage bag on the table for you. Uh, the way it's packaged, it's packaged clean. Uh, it's not really packaged sterile, so a lot of times we ask them not to put it on the tray and just hand it to us at the end of the procedure. But for the sake of illustration, when you have the drainage bag, the first thing you want to do is sort of tighten the bottom uh, valve so that uh, once it fills with whatever is draining out of the patient, it doesn't leak. Uh, this is one that when the nurses want to empty the bag, they're going to open this and let it drain and then you just want to make sure it's closed so that it doesn't leak uh, at, uh, when you first attach it to the patient. Then we remove this cover, and this also uh, is connected to a vinyl connecting tube, the same tube that I just showed you. Uh, and when you connect these two items, you have to use quite a bit of strength to push it in very firmly so that it's a, a, a tight connection and won't leak. And then this will attach to your drainage catheter. show you that one example of a drainage catheter that we use. So this catheter is a 14 French uh, all-purpose drainage catheter and one of the first things you're going to do is you're going to want to straighten out the loop and advance the metal stiffener and cannula. So the way I do this is I always straighten out the loop with one hand so that I don't damage the catheter as I advance the metal stiffener. And then you can advance the metal stiffener. You can also use this plastic tube to kind of come over the loop and keep the loop straight as you push in the metal stiffener and cannula. Now, this piece of paper, I just simply fold this tab and then uh, Way. So I fold it uh, so that I can then remove the paper. Okay, and then this red tab is simply preventing the sharp stylet from sticking out until you have the loop completely straightened out with the metal stiffener all the way in and seated. Notice this is a lower lock that we tightened. So now you can remove this paper tab push the, the sharp stylet all the way to the end, and I like to kind of straighten out the tip so that I don't damage the tip. And then push the sharp stylet through, screw it in. This is also a lure lock, and now you can see the metal tip is sticking out. And notice this thread that's going to help form the loop. We don't want that to have any slack during the insertion, so we'll pull on the thread at the hub just to get rid of the slack. So now, this catheter is ready for trocar insertion with that sharp stylet sticking out. If we're going to do Seldinger technique, we're simply going to remove the sharp stylet and put it out of the way, and then we're ready to put this over a guide wire. Once we, are fit and we have the drainage catheter in place, we usually use a three-way stopcock instead of a two-way stopcock. Uh, for abscess drain catheters uh, or any fluid collection that we're going to drain and potentially irrigate. Um, the one exception is pleural collections, uh, especially if it's a free pleural collection. We generally uh, use a two-way stopcock because we don't usually irrigate 
a free plural collection. Um, but for all other drainages, we're going to put a three-way stopcock on. And so it's nice to have all of this stuff set up and ready to go before you even start your procedure. That way, you don't have to pause and continue setting up uh, as you're doing the procedure. The procedure, we're going to secure the catheter, and we often use an adhesive fixation device. This is called a stay fix. And uh, one thing about this uh, particular design is that the uh, once the catheter is in the patient's body, there's a split here, and that goes around the catheter, and the catheter kind of seats in a hole, and then it drapes over into a groove, and you kind of press it in there, and then there's an adhesive that goes over it. But notice that it can kink the catheter, and so we've noticed that that's a problem. So what we do frequently is we take a thick pad of paper or something, a towel or something so that we don't cut through the, uh, the sterile cover on the table. And then we take our scalpel and we're simply going to extend this hole all the way to the ends. Uh, so I'm going to take the scalpel and just cut and cut. And what I've essentially done is extended the hole all the way to the end. And now what I can do is when I have the catheter in the patient's body, I can just bring this up to here. And instead of pushing the catheter all the way to this hump, it's going to be back about a centimeter or two. And then when I peel this adhesive off, I can lay the catheter in that groove. And then this adhesive Go, come over the top to sort of seal the catheter in place and uh, because this angle is more gradual it's less likely to kink the catheter and of course the adhesive on the back you've already attached you've already removed this and attached it to the patient's body okay So when we do fine needle aspiration biopsies, um, if you think about it, we, we use a fine needle, we get a biopsy sample, and you can either hand off your needle uh, to the cytopathology technologist so that they can make slides, but if you hand off the needle, it's no longer sterile, they're going to keep it and discard it, and so then you have to use a brand new needle for another pass, and we sometimes do multiple passes when we do fine needle aspiration biopsies. So it's always good to use a pack of sterile slides. And so we have packs of 10 that are sterile and uh, they're wrapped in gauze. And you can just take one end of the gauze and in your hand just gently pull on one end and it will put all the slides on in your hand or on the table. And if you look at these slides, there's a frosty side and a, and a shiny side. And you want the frosty side facing up because that's what the cytotechnologist can write on to label the slide. And in this case, uh, you can see that there's a word snow coat. And if you can read the word snow coat, then that means the frosty side is facing up. So just arrange your slide so that uh, the word snow coat is legible. And then you've, you've got them correctly uh, oriented. And then when you, uh, when you have taken a fine needle aspiration biopsy, so for example, you've, you've done your biopsy, you've got a sample, you're going to put it on the slide, and what the cytopathologists want is they just want you to put a tiny drop of fluid on the slide, just a very small drop, not a big drop, and certainly not a, not a lake of, of a solution, just put a drop, and you can either make one or two slides, and then the rest of it you're going to push into your saline solution, and then they can later spin that down to make a cell block. Um, once you put a one or two drops of fluid on one or two slides, you can then hand it off to the cytotechnologist who will take it, 
they will smear it, they'll stain it, they'll look at it uh, under the microscope and tell you if you have adequacy. Um, and then if you need to take more samples, you can use your same needle to go back repeatedly uh, because it's still sterile. You haven't contaminated the needle. When you take a core biopsy, uh, you now have the sample trapped in the uh, in the slot in, inside your core biopsy needle. So you're going to recock it and then push out the stylet, and that exposes the core sample. And if you come and take a look at the slot, if you imagine you've got tissue sitting in this slot, uh, you have kind of two choices. My favorite way to uh, put the specimens uh, in a container is to simply directly put this slot into a formalin container and usually it'll be uh, located, um, the nurse will bring it to you or the tech will bring it to you. And I'll just put my needle in the formalin and flick, flick off the sample into the formalin. The beauty of that is that the sample is not stuck to any type of gauze or paper or telpho. It's just floating in the, in the formalin. It doesn't get lost um, or stuck to any material. And, uh, also, you don't crush the tissue by trying to get it off of the needle. It's just flicked off into the formalin solution. The only thing is that the formalin is an antiseptic, so it, it doesn't contaminate your needle from a bacterial point of, point of view, uh, but it does have formalin on it. And so what we do then is after we put the sample in formalin, we just rinse off the needle in saline, and then we can go back and reinsert it for another sample. If you do not want to put your sample directly in formalin or saline, then what you can do is take a piece of telpha, and I usually just dip it in saline so it's wet, and then I lay the telpha on my finger so that it's flat and supported, and then I just kind of pinch one in with my thumb. And then I take my core biopsy needle, and I touch the tissue to the paper on one end, and so if you think about it, the, the core slot is sort of sideways touching the telpha pad so that the tissue is in contact with the paper. But I'm never pressing. I just touch it so the tissue's in contact and then pull and it generally comes right off onto the telpha. And notice when I hold the core biopsy needle, I hold it close to the specimen so that I have control. If I hold the handle and try to do this, I have no control. It just kind of flicks off and I, I don't have nearly the control I, I have as when I hold it here. The other thing is that people often will brace it against the palm of their hand and what they're trying to do is they, they're trying to press the tissue onto the paper to get it off. The problem with that is that you then get crush artifacts on the histopathology uh, uh, evaluation. They, they can actually see it under the microscope, and that's not helpful. So instead of, don't think of it as pushing the tissue into the telpha. Think of it as just holding the needle here and lightly touching the tissue to the telpha and pulling so that it comes off. It takes a little bit of practice, but once you get the hang of it, it's very easy to get the tissue off without crushing it. And then you can hand this off to the research coordinator, for example, if it's a research biopsy, or you can even put it into a, a container of formalin or saline. Again, the reason I usually don't do that is just because sometimes the tissue sticks even to telpha, and I always am concerned that maybe they don't get all the tissue off you could lose a fragment of, of the specimen. Okay, at the end of the procedure, you generally will have a few needles and scalpels or other sharp sharps on your table, and it's our job to put those into the sharps container so that nobody uh, gets stuck. So what you'll do is you'll take all your sharps. Uh, this is a, an example of a sharps container. It has a foot so control. You just press on that. Carefully drop your sharps in and close the lid. And just make sure all your sharps 
including glass slides, even needles, uh, go into the trash, into the sharks. The last topic I would like to cover is uh, interacting with the patient. And although this is really getting beyond setup and preparation for the procedure, it's so important I would like to review this before you begin your rotation. So how you talk to the patient uh, during the procedure, of course before, but also during the procedure, is so important not only to the patient experience, but also to the success of your procedure. So I'd like you to review these last couple slides carefully. It is understood that you are learning how to do these procedures and there is a lot to think about as you uh, practice doing procedures for the first time and even for the first hundred times. But you still want to try to increasingly pay attention to how you talk to the patient throughout the procedure and how what you say is influencing the way the patient feels and reacts and cooperates with your uh, procedure. Sometimes how you talk to the patient can be the difference between being able to do the procedure and complete the procedure and not being able to complete it or do it at all. As you gain experience, you will get better and better at this uh, communication with the patient during the procedure and it will become second nature and uh, it will not slow you down at all. You can work just as fast and sometimes even faster because of the fact that you're communicating effectively with the patient. The last thing I would like you to consider is that uh, many patients are frightened by medical devices, needles, syringes, and the equipment that we use during these procedures. And so I try to keep all these things out of their line of sight. I bring it from the procedure table kind of low to the uh, sterile field uh, out of their line of sight. Uh, and I certainly don't wave it in front of their face or click uh, biopsy needles in front of their face to demonstrate, um, you know, unless they you know, are one of these rare patients that ask you to see a device or something like that. Uh, so that's, a, that's something that you can incorporate into your workflow that will probably help with your patient's uh, overall experience. In closing, I would like to thank Dr. Yang Go for assisting with the videotaping of this uh, presentation. And uh, finally, uh, that's the end of this presentation. I think uh, you're ready to go, and we look forward to having you on your rotations with us in CSIR. Good luck.